Asanteni sana kwa kuwa pamoja nasi kwenye uhusiano wa imani. Obrigado por sintonizar a Conexão da Fé. Gracias por sintonizarnos en la Conexión de Fé. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. Hello, my name is Ralph Sepek. I'm a missionary to Guyana, South America, as well as a preacher of the gospel. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and um, I thank for the opportunity to be able to share God's Word today. And I'll be preaching a message titled today called Good Master. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 13, uh, starting at verse 22 first. The Bible says, <clears throat> Now he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one to him, Lord, there are few that be saved. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Once upon the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, shut to the door, ye begin to stand without and knock and the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know ye not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. And thou hast taught in our streets, but he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. And I'm going to look at that verse 27 for a minute. I want us to think about that passage of scripture, that verse, and how horrible that would be. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of of iniquity. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. That is a permanent, the permanent phrase. See, at this point, when we reach heaven or we stand before God, if God were to say, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, think about that. There is no other opportunity to be able to be saved and to go to heaven. With that passage of scripture in mind, Let's go back. I'm going to go back a few verses to verse, verse 24 at the beginning. It's going to be real quick right there. Well, verse 23, the Bible says, Then said unto him, one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. I want to kind of focus on for right now <clears throat> on that portion of Scripture that we're talking about right there. The question was, are there few that be saved? And Jesus talks about a straight gate, a narrow gate, where, where, where few people will enter in. And later there's another passage of scripture, the Bible says there is a wide gate, but that leads to destruction. Jesus says there is a narrow gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, the narrow gate. For I say in, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to, shall not be able to. And for uh, just a moment, I want to look at this passage of Scripture where it says, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Now that appears that that is a labor, a work that you have to do to go to heaven. The word strive means to fight, to labor fervently, to struggle. That is, although that is what that appears to be, that's not what that verse means. The word strive is the Greek word agonizomai. The very even half or the root word of that word sounds like our word for agony or agonize. Agonize. That sounds like a, a emotional type of striving or a spiritual emotional type of striving. Agonizomai. Or striving enter into straight gate. There is a a, strive, a striving or an agonizing in a person's heart at the point where he is to believe on Jesus Christ. There's a struggle of giving up yourself to die, deny yourself in this passage of scripture, in this. Now I want us to think about that with that in our mind as we have already gone down to Luke verse 27. I'm going to take us back down to... Uh, Verse 25 says, once the master of the house is risen up 
and they're shut to the door and you begin to stand without and knocked at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. Now think about that passage of scripture. Thinking, you know, a person thinking that they've been pretty good and they've done works for God and they, and they were to stand before God and thinking, you know, Lord, let me in. And the Lord says, open and, and, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Can you imagine at the judgment day when you stand before God, and we're all going to give account of ourselves to God. And we would be at the north kind of uh, thinking or in our hearts and minds of what this would be like. And we don't know what heaven's going to be like. We don't know what's going to, what it's going to be like when we get there and stand before God. But having the idea in your mind that you're, standing, that you're going to be before God, thinking God's going to open the door to you. And he says, I know not whence you are. How catastrophic that would be. Then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and, have, and, thou, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now I hesitate to give you this illustration. I, as I was preparing this message, preparing the scripture, I too have a testimony somewhat of what it's talking about right there. I made a profession years ago. I, I was told to read the Romans road. That's kind of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it said, if you want to be saved, pray this prayer with me. And I was a Catholic. I was used to praying prayers. So I prayed that prayer, but I never had true assurance of salvation. But I got involved in church and God, I knew I had to be in church and start reading my Bible. And I started reading the Bible. I started going to church and even doing some praying. But still, I didn't have assurance of my salvation for a long time. I eventually got out of the Marine Corps and went to Bible college. And there were times where I would struggle about my personal salvation. I, yes, I was in Bible college. I had been in church a long time. I had been reading my Bible. But there were times where I would struggle about my salvation. And when I would read this passage of scripture, because I try to read my Bible through at least once every one or two years. And I would read this passage of scripture and others like it. And my heart would be under conviction. I'd be bothered by it. And I'd start, you know, dotting again. Well, I, am I really saved? And I struggled with this for a long time. And I kind of want to share a testimony. In 2005, my oldest son was diagnosed with cancer and we had to come off the mission field. We were working on the island of Trinidad. When my son was diagnosed with cancer and he would start a treatment, I, I, I would try and pray for him. And I knew I didn't have power with God in my prayer. The truth is, I really wasn't saved. See, you can pray a prayer out of salvation. And if you have, don't truly have faith in your heart on the belief, uh, and belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can pray a prayer and not be saved. You, your faith would be in that prayer and not on Jesus Christ. And like I said, I hesitate to say this because I don't want to confuse anybody. The Bible says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I was a Catholic. I knew how to pray to our Father, the Hail Mary. I knew how to pray written scriptures. And, I, and as I prayed that prayer, I believe that's what it was, was not faith in Jesus Christ. I, and I would go back and say, well, I prayed that prayer that day and I'm saved. My faith and trust was in that prayer and not in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, literally, when I would read these verses, I would get upset and wonder, did I really get saved? And that went on for a number of years in 2010. I'm sharing this my testimony because I really was not going to put this testimony in this message and I was not going to preach. But I, the other morning as I was preparing, God convicted my heart. I want you to tell this. And for those out there who need to hear this, I want, please pay attention. I was, I was preaching. I was still trying to prepare to go back to Trinidad or, or even, as, you know, preparing to go back to Trinidad as a missionary and things weren't working out. And I remember being in the church. I was in Oklahoma. And as I was talking with the pastor, we were quoting scripture. And along this time, I was absolutely miserable, praying, asking God to show me what was wrong because I believe God was bringing everything to a head. He was showing me I could no longer live what I was living. And God was giving me another chance. You see, I was... I was a preacher of the gospel and I was doing all the good things. I, I could preach. I could write messages. I could go to church and I could tell people about Jesus. I could show them from the word of God how they can be saved. But in my heart, I did not have true assurance of salvation. I did not have salvation. 
And please believe me, I don't want to confuse anybody, but this is what was on my heart. And it came to a head. My son had not gotten any better from cancer, and I, and that bothered me, and other problems were going on, and that bothered me, but still, I was still praying, and I was still reading my Bible, but in my heart, I knew there's something desperately wrong. And I would ask God, God, please show me what's wrong in my heart. And as I was out there that pat, with that pastor in Oklahoma, I quoted John 6:44. We were talking back and forth. I quoted John 6:44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. And God convicted my heart and said, I never drew you. And I heard, and, and in my heart I just knew there was something wrong. And I actually Although I was asking God to show me what was wrong, God showed me what was wrong. I didn't want to believe it. Because why? Because I, I, I told people how to be saved. I did many good works. But it, look what the Bible says. But he shall say, on, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. If that would have been me at that point, God would have said, depart from me. I never knew you. And I was preaching. I was doing all the good things. But in my heart, I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would see my wife. She, literally, she sometimes I could see her walking in the room and she would just be singing hymns in her heart and humming. What a spirit. And, I, and there were times I'd even fuss at her. And then moments later, she could still have that joy in her heart and him. And I didn't have it. And as I was up with that pastor in Oklahoma and that, that took place in my heart, I was more miserable. And I, and I was praying, asking God, show me. God, show me where I'm wrong. If I'm not saved, save me. Well, that's not the prayer of faith. And so <clears throat> it didn't get any better. I went to another church. And I was in uh, Jacksonville, Arkansas at a Bible conference. And I remember walking up and down. I was with other missionaries that whole week. And we would talk about the Lord. And I'd see something in them that I didn't have. And I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning every day. And I'd walk up and down that that property or that church, and I'd pray and ask God to show me what's wrong. Nothing happened. I kept praying. I kept seeking God, and my heart was breaking because I was absolutely miserable at this point. It wasn't but a week later I went home, and for the first time in my life I told my wife I'm dotting my salvation, and she broke down in tears. My wife never cries. She has cries with tears of joy. She very rarely have I heard her cry except when I made her cry through fussing at her. And that, that wasn't often, but it happened. But she started crying. She said, God put in my heart to pray for your salvation that week you were gone. See, she was praying for my sons that weren't saved yet. And she was asking God to save them. And by mistake, she said my name. And God said, no, you keep praying. At that moment, I, I couldn't take it anymore. I had no will to fight, but I didn't make a decision then. We got to church that morning, that next Sunday morning. Our pastor was preaching out of Ephesians chapter 2, and you had to quicken who were dead in trespasses and sins. And God convicted my heart, so I never quickened you. That word quicken means to be made alive. God said, I never quickened you. I never made you alive. And that morning I went forward, and I bowed my head and got on my knees and trusted Christ as my Savior for the first time. God changed my life. I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I trusted him. I just, basically all I did is just, just trusted him. That's all it took was to trust him. Trust what his word says. He loves me. He paid for, he paid for my sins for the wages of sin and death. I knew about that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. That gift I have never received. I received it I, just by trusting him. That's already paid for. Everything is done. I trusted Christ as my Savior. And that day, the Lord changed my life. Literally, I, I fell in love with the Word of God. I stay in the Word of God on a regular basis. And I, and, but the Lord started showing me different things from His Word. I spent six months just reading and studying the book of Romans because of the change that was in my heart. I wanted to get more of God, more of His Word, and I wanted to understand it more. The Holy Spirit was teaching me. And I thank God for that change that took place in my life. And that's why I'm here today, because I want people to know that same Lord that saved me. I want you to know him. He loves you. He died for you. Let's go to another passage of scripture in Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> Jesus was also uh, speaking again. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 10, and 
Verse 17, the Bible says that when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now that sounds like a noble question. Good master, what things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to look at that. There, there's a paradox in that passage of Scripture. He says, good master. First of all, Saul calling him good master, he is not believing on the Lord right there. Many of the people in the Bible, when they talked to Jesus, if they never truly believed on him, never trusted him, they never called him Lord. Calling Jesus Lord is, to say, is literally what he is saying. He is, your, he is your Lord. He is in control of your life. And he says, good master, he wasn't ready to put you, make Jesus Christ his Lord. He wasn't really ready to believe on him yet. He said, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, wait a minute. Inherit, inheritance is nothing you can really do because it's already done for you. You are a child of the person that's going to give you that eternal life or that inheritance. You are a child. That's, that's, going, to do, that's going to take place because you are a child. He says, what shall I do that I may inherit? You can't do nothing to inherit anything because it's only because you're a child. He wanted to do some good work. And God says, it's not a good work. And Jesus said to him, why callest thou me good? There is none good, not, there's none good but one, and that is God. See, Jesus was God. Was he calling him good because he was God or was he calling him good because it was a good thing? Jesus was getting to, the, to the, the very center of his heart in these questions. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. Well, those are good things to do. That's what the commandment, Ten Commandments says. Verse 20, he says, He answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth up. He says he's done all these things from his youth up. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. I like that, how he says he loved him. He knew he wasn't in the right way. He knew he wasn't saved. He says, one thing thou lackest. He said, beholding him, beholding him, he loved him, but he had to tell him the truth. And today, I'm telling you the truth today through the word of God, that if you're without Jesus Christ, you need to be saved. One thing thou lackest, go thy way. Sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. Now Jesus is not telling that man, in order to be saved, he has to sell all his goods, give to the poor, and follow Jesus. I'm not going to tell you you need to do that. If you were to do that and sell all your goods, give to the poor, and follow Jesus, that would not save you. Jesus wasn't saying that would save him, but Jesus knew what was in that man's heart. And what was in that heart, man's heart was the covetousness and the love for money because Jesus knew what his answer would be. He was sad, and he was sad and sat at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Jesus knew what was in that man's heart. He wasn't ready to commit his life to Jesus Christ and follow him. And Jesus knew that because his possessions were what, what was actually his God. His possessions were in control of him. His possessions is what caused him to motivate him in his life. Yes, he was probably a, a very moral man and did good things. He said he obeyed the Ten Commandments and from his youth up. The problem is, if you break one command, you're guilty of all, Jesus tells us. He told one man, if you lust upon a woman, you've already committed adultery with her in her heart. And if you coveted someone else's wife or coveted someone else's goods, you've already broken the law of thievery by coveting it that bad. You say, well, that's very hard sayings because we're all like that. The truth is we are sinful. We cannot fulfill the Ten Commandments. And that's what Jesus is telling this man. The Ten Commandments, those good things you do aren't good enough. And as the Bible says, after he heard that he had to sell all that he has to feed the poor and follow him, he was saying when he was sad and rejected that and that he walked away grieved, it's because he wasn't ready to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. His heart wasn't conditioned. His heart wasn't prepared yet. 
Maybe we don't know. Maybe this man got saved later, but he has, but from what we see here, the Bible says that he was sad at that saying and went away grief for he had great possessions. Remember, early in the message, we heard, strive to enter in at the straight gate. What this man refused or what this man failed to do was to strive to enter in. You see, there is a striving that's going to take place in our heart. I remember I told you how miserable I was for that last year before I got saved. I was under conviction. I was miserable. God was showing me I was lost. And I was, I was striving. Because that striving would, you know, think about this. A man who's preached for 15 years, a man who is compared to many people's eyes to be a godly person. People looked up to me. And for me to admit that I was not, wasn't even saved yet would bring a lot of shame in my life and a lot of, at least in my mind, that's what I was thinking. And that striving one day took second place because I knew I had to have Jesus. I knew I had to have the Lord. I had to believe on him for salvation. I didn't care what all my preacher friends thought. I didn't care what they said. I knew I needed Jesus. No matter what happened, I trusted Christ as my Savior, and God changed my life. I don't regret any moment of it. I remember after I got saved, I would walk around other preachers, and they kind of look at me and maybe not shun me, but it was not the same. I remember before I got saved, I like hearing being called the name the man of God. I didn't have that for, I didn't have people call me a man of God anymore. But you know something? It was so much greater knowing that I was a child of God. That if I would stand before God and God would say, hey, Ralph, I've been waiting for you to get here. Not the other verses that said, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, it's that important. It's that important to know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, and I've said this many times, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but sorrow of this world worketh death. I had to have Jesus. I, and I, and I, God gave me that godly sorrow, and I had to believe on Jesus Christ. I trusted Christ as my Savior. The Lord changed my life that day. I have that peace that passes all understanding, and I have the joy of the Holy Ghost because I have believed on Jesus Christ. But there's a worldly sorrow the Bible talks about. That worldly sorrow won't do you any good. No matter how many times you say you're sorry, no matter how many times you show regret for what you have done until you believe on Jesus Christ, it's not going to help you. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 15, the Bible says here, Mark chapter 10, verse 13. I actually had it there and I moved away from Mark chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible tells us here. The Bible says here, and they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And the disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his arms upon them and blessed them. Let's hear what the word of God says one more time. And they brought young children to him, and that he should touch them. And the disciples rebuked them, and brought uh, that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he he was much displeased. Displeased, and he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. God says that the kingdom of God is like little children. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. I want us to think about that. Let's think about children. Children want to please their fathers. When they're younger, most of the time, they want to please their fathers. I know when they turn teenagers, we see a different action, but even in their heart, they do want to please their fathers. But little children, man, they worship their father. I remember when I was a little child, I would would see my dad walking down the street, and I'd 
I take a step everywhere he stepped, and he his straight his 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 uh, step was about a foot longer than my step, but I'd still I'd step in every place where my dad put his foot down. And anything my dad told me, I would believe it to be the gospel. I'd believe it to be the truth. Well, that's in essence what Jesus is telling us that we need to do. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. You see, when we get older, we have things in our lives that kind of block us. We, we put up guards. We put up barriers in our life for protection. Protection from being hurt. Protection from being caught about the wrong things we do. You see, children don't have those barriers. Children are wide open. They're honest. It's amazing how honest children really are. They'll say things that amazes you. I remember I was preaching in the church and a man wanted to know if my son wanted to go to Sunday school in another class. And my son said, no, I want to go to the other class. He said, you don't want to hear your dad preach? My son said, I heard him preach already. That was absolutely honest. Children are like that. But God wants us to come to him as a little child with open honesty in our hearts. And like I said, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. God wants us to almost revert back as a little child by faith, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, trust in him as our Lord and Savior. When we think about that rich young ruler, he never came to that point. He never strived. You see, again, talking about that striving to enter in, there's there's. There's got to be a striving in your life. What am I mean? I mean, there's got to be a surrender in your heart where you're willing to say, God, you take control of my life. I want Jesus Christ more than anything else. And until you're ready to do that, I don't believe you're honestly ready to be saved. I believe the Bible teaches that just that, that rich young roller. He wanted eternal life, but he wanted something he could do that he can get the glory of, that he can get the honor he wanted to keep his riches. And I can understand wanting wealth, but, but that was controlling him. That striving just was not there. But I believe right now there's some people striving to, striving in their hearts saying, I, I just, I just can't give my life to Jesus Christ because of this or because, what will my friends think? What will my family say? What will the other people say? My life will have to change so much. But I want to tell you, it's a life of joy. It's a life of grace. It's a life of strength. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word, be able to preach and share the testimony of your grace in my life and how that you saved me. Lord, there's people out there right now that are dealing with, but I believe you're dealing with right now that need to be saved. And I pray, Lord, you continue to show them your love. Continue to show them your conviction so they can believe on you and trust you as their Savior. I ask these things in your name today. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.